Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to cover some orientation materials. I apologize in advance, this is not a tremendously interesting topic, but I think that it sets you up well for success in the course. I'll try to be as brief as possible, but we do have a lot of material to cover, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to go do the PowerPoint presentation uh, later on, but I'm going to wanted to start with that slide just so you'd feel welcome. Um, let's begin with the syllabus. The syllabus will vary from semester to semester, so some of the specifics here may be different. You'll see on the first page of the syllabus the last date you can withdraw from for the course for that particular semester. Um, this date will apply to any of your 16-week courses. Um, it's a good idea to calendar this on your calendar, however you calendar things, so that you'll have that information. I certainly hope that you decide not to drop this course, but it's still good information for you to have. Let me pause before we get too much into the weeds and suggest that you pause me and get a notebook handy. As we go through this orientation, you're going to want to take careful notes because, honest to goodness, you're not going to want to watch this video several times. And so you'll want to get the nuggets that you need so you can watch it just one time. Well, it's not going to work out that well for you if you don't have this material. So um, from time to time, you're going to pause me, you're going to write down the information, you're going to take a screenshot, whatever you want to do to keep a record of what we're talking about so that you'll have that information because you are responsible for it. I'm not going to be providing this information multiple times throughout the course. Uh, a popular thing that I tell students is that's something I cover in the orientation. Feel free to go back and review and refresh yourself on that material. You'll find the answer there. I'm not going to give it to you multiple times because I mean, this is a college course and we're all adults and I'm going to treat you like an adult. I'm going to ask that you treat me like an adult. When I share information, I'm going to count on you to follow through and keep that information handy. So this is the date for this particular semester. It'll be different depending upon the semester. You'll also find that the next page is just kind of technical technology um, issues. Most folks aren't even going to need to review that information. Then we get to the section that talks about um, semester specific things. My office hours for that particular semester and you'll see that I have some virtual office hours. I recognize that many many students working during the day or uh, maybe are taking this course from a remote location and it's just not possible to come to my office hours. In my experience, the most successful office hours are when we meet face to face, but it's better that we meet in an alternative way than not meet at all. And so you are welcome to come to my office hours by calling me or by visiting office hours virtually. And honestly, nothing could be easier than visiting my virtual office hours. And the way that you go about doing it is you literally just click on this link right here. Let me just make it go here. You just click on it. Control click and you will it'll be taken into my office hour room or virtual room If you are using an iPhone, then you can uh, use this uh, method if so this is for Android this is for iPhones If you're using a landline or you prefer not to connect virtually, but you just want to call me then you can certainly use a telephone um, I've never actually had anybody who had any difficulty getting into my virtual office, so I think it is very unlikely that you'll have a problem, but if you do, no worries. Just go ahead and send me an email. Um, I'll be online already. I'll be able to see your email, and we'll figure out what we need to do to get you and, and me hooked up so that we can have our meeting. You'll see that my office hours will usually specify which ones are Zoom office hours and which ones are traditional office hours. When I'm on my traditional office hours, many times I can do a Zoom meeting. Um, I don't always have my headphones with me, but at least we can talk on the telephone. Um, when I do my Zoom meetings, usually I'm not available for face-to-face -face meetings because I'm doing this in my jammies at home, to be honest with you. And so, um, but if I know in advance that you want to meet with me face-to-face -face during my Zoom hours, um, most of the time I'm able to come into my office and uh, not be in my jammies and we could meet up. And again, these are times that I'm available, but I can also be flexible and meet with you at other times. I recognize that sometimes students have complicated schedules, and so we can work out a time that might be more convenient. I do hope that you will make a point of coming by and visiting me. Um, I find that, that there are kind of three categories of students. One category are students who come to get assistance, and I provide really, really helpful assistance in my office hours because I'm so thankful that students come to see me. So you'll find once you come once, usually those students are like, wow, if I had 
any idea that you were going to be this helpful, I would have started coming from the beginning of the semester. And then I have a regular office hour buddy from that point on. So that's one category of student. Another category of students is a student who stops by just to kind of shake my hand, introduce himself or herself, and develop a bit of a connection. Um, I really, really appreciate those students too. Um, it takes a certain level of courage to come to an, a, uh, uh, your instructor's office and to, to introduce, and I really admire that. Usually those are the students who have kind of the most poise, the most professionalism. It leads a really, really good impression. And many times these students stop in for two or three minutes. Hi, how are you? This is my name. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'll ask a few questions conversational questions, we'll shake hands, it'll be delightful. And I will think, wow, that is somebody who's going places in this world. Be that person. Even if you don't need help or don't want help in the coursework, be the person who comes by and introduces himself or herself. It is a wonderful skill to develop, and I am glad to be that guinea pig that's going to help you get over that hurdle. Um, I will tell you a story about myself. Um, when I was in college, I went to exactly one office hour. Um, it was uh, for an advanced math course. I'm pretty good in math, but I'm not great in math. And I had signed up for a course. It was, um, I think it was the second semester in calculus. And um, I was a little bit in over my head. And my, my grades were really important to me because I wanted to go to law school. And, and grades are really important uh, to get into law school. And so um, I had a graduate student who was my instructor, really, really nice guy. And I went to see him in his office hours. And he was so helpful and so nice. And I remember thinking, why was I so scared about this? Um, having said that, I never attended any other office hours um, other than maybe to ask for letters of recommendation or something. Uh, so uh, it's, I know that it's intimidating. I've been in that situation, but I promise you I am about the least intimidating person on the planet. I just am. Sometimes I try to be intimidating. Usually when I try to be intimidating, it's uh, an unsuccessful attempt to intimidate my 13-year-old. <laughs> that is always unsuccessful. Um, if I can't intimidate 13-year-olds, I don't think I can intimidate you and a, an adult. So please come by um, and uh, at least uh, introduce yourself if nothing else. The third category is like 95% of the students in the class. And these students, I will never get the opportunity to meet. I will see your name. I will see your work. But you will be essentially a stranger to me. I guess you'll know me a little bit because you'll be hearing all of my lectures. Um, that makes me sad uh, that we won't have that opportunity to connect. Uh, so don't be in that 95%. Be in the super cool, awesome, cool kids group of people who actually come and meet me. I very much appreciate it. And you know what? I'm also the one who does the grading, so you do the math. Anyway, um, so that's our virtual office hours situation, and these are my face-to-face -face meetings. Again, these times might vary, but the, this is where you find it on the syllabus. Let me talk about email. There are two ways you can email me, and one is awesome and tremendous and lovely, and the other is a really, really bad idea. I'm going to show you both, but I want you to develop amnesia for one because I don't want you to do this. This is my email address. It's C Groover. C is my first name is Cynthia, so C and then Groover, my last name. You'll see it's strangely got a V here. Most people think it's going to have a B. Blame my husband. It's some kind of German name of some type anyway. So it's cgruber at colin.edu. This is the way to contact me outside of my office hours. Um, I am pretty compulsive about responding to my emails. Um, oftentimes I kind of freak people out because I will respond to it almost before they hit the send message. I can't promise you I'll do that every single time. I mean, I'm in class and I've got a life on my own, so I'm not going to promise super, super quick responses, but don't be surprised if you get a response almost instantaneously. Um, this is the quickest way to reach me and the best way to reach me outside of my office hours. There is another way, though, you can attempt to reach me, and it is a really, really bad idea. Let me show you what that is. Over here, you have something called an inbox. And if you click on that, you can actually, actually, it's not going to let me do this. Um, but if, if, this really, if you really were a student in class, you'd have the opportunity to send me an email. Um, and so, or not an email, but kind of a message. And uh, don't do it because 
I don't monitor it. And so you could send me one, you know, the first day of the semester. And I'm, I mean, probably before the end of the semester, I'll happen to glance and look at it. Um, but weeks could go by. It's just not something that I use. There's a lot of reasons I don't use it, but you don't care why I don't use it. The bottom line is I don't use it. Now, the fact that I don't use it doesn't mean that other uh, faculty members don't use it and may even prefer it. So I'm not giving you kind of a global statement, never use this tool. This might be absolutely the perfect tool to do in another class. Um, uh, another thing to keep in mind is that um, I can't turn it off. So it's going to be there all semester. Just don't click on it. Uh, go ahead and send me the email. So you may want to stop right now and make a notation in your folder that you prepare for this class. Don't use the email for Groover and no other uh, tool. And again, it's on the syllabus. So if you forget, you're, you're golden here. Okay, um, this is my telephone number in my office, but you know what? I'm never in my office outside of my office hours. I work from home. I've got kids. I've got things that are going on. I work a lot, but I don't work from that location. And so if you call me um, and, and, and catch me during my office hours, awesome, great. Please use the telephone number. But outside of that, it is so much quicker to send me an email. Now, don't think that just because I'm saying send me an email, don't call, that I don't want to talk to you. I'm happy. In fact, I prefer to talk on the phone versus email. But but when you send me the email, we can schedule a time to have that conversation. And so uh, this is not going to be the best way to reach me. The best way outside of my office hours is going to be email. If you leave a, a voicemail here, uh, you're, shoot, you're, you're talking to yourself because I'm not going to get it sometimes for days and days. Email is a lot quicker way of reaching me. Here is the textbook. There's lots of different ways of getting this textbook. Barnes and Noble, the bookstore that we have here on campus, will will provide it for you. Uh, you can uh, rent it. You can buy a paper version. Um, you can rent a paper version. Um, you can uh, have an an, an ebook version. We actually have a custom version that you can get to the bookstore too, if that is what you would like. The custom version doesn't include all the chapters of the, of the book. So there's lots of different ways you can purchase it. It's really your decision which one you want to buy. There's lots of factors that go into it. Sometimes it's easier if you are uh, financial on the financial aid to buy it through the bookstore. Otherwise, you may be able to get a, a good deal, say from Chegg or Half Price Books, or Amazon or something like that. Um, the, um, the edition isn't so important, but I will tell you this, if you get an older edition, the chapter numbering has changed. And so um, be looking not so much at the chapter number, but the name of the chapter to make sure that you're actually looking at the right chapter. Um, if you need help with that, I'm glad to, uh, we can do it by the telephone or in face-to-face -to, -face to kind of figure out how to correlate your chapter numbers with the chapter numbers that are uh, posted in, in um, this particular course. So that's one thing to watch out for, but you definitely, if you haven't already purchased the book, you can definitely save some money by buying an older edition. Let me go to the next topic. Here is, this is so important. I can't tell you how many students will, close to the end of the semester, uh, kind of contact me in a panic and say, can you calculate my grade for me? I don't know how I'm doing. And um, I'm happy to assist students who come to my office hours. Um, and I'll sit down and I'll show you how to do it. But you know what? You don't need me. This is about fifth grade math. There's nothing difficult here. Um, you can do this, I promise you. If you are in college, you have graduated from fifth grade, and so you have this mathematical skills to accomplish this. The equation is right here, and you just need to populate the information. You will find the data in the grade section. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, so you'll use this equation with the grades that are posted in Canvas, and you'll be able to calculate your own grade. Again, I'm happy to help. Just come see me. Now, I don't do it by email, but I'm happy to sit down with you because what I do is I show you how to do it. And that way, next semester when you're having another instructor who may not be able to help you do the calculations, you'll, you will know how to go about doing it. Another reason that this is so important, this is actually the more important reason that you want to be familiar with this equation, is that it tells you where to invest your time. You can see here that tests are a pretty significant part of your grade, but if you don't do the out-of-class non-test assignments, you are not going to be successful. You are not going to pass the, the class. Every now and again, I'll have a student who aces the test, but doesn't do the other activities. You 
you, you know, it's not going to end well for that person because you have to go ahead and do all of these pieces. And we'll talk more about these pieces um, as the semester goes forward. But this lets you know where to invest your effort so you don't um, spend it in areas that aren't as important. As we go through uh, the PowerPoint later on, I'll show you some more ways that you'll want to tweak where you put your energy and where you don't put your energy. Um, because it's more important to be smart than to be hardworking sometimes in a class. So this tells you where to invest your energy. And it also, all syllabi are going to have this information. The orientation quiz, you need to take that. You can check, um, let me just show you right now. You can check to see when the due date is. For this particular semester, you have to complete it by February 3rd. It'll be right below the, the name of the activity, in this case, the Canvas orientation quiz. It'll give you that particular date. And so you'll need to complete it by that point in time. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you, you've reviewed all the materials, you sit down to take the quiz, and you probably are going to get 100 your first shot. But you know what? Maybe you missed one. Um, and so you can take it again. In fact, you can take it three times. You just need to take um, a day break between them. So be sure to take it not, don't take it that first time on February 3rd. Take it um, one or more days uh, before that so that you, in the unlikely event you miss a question, you'll be able to go ahead and fix that. Okay, you need to earn at least a 90. If you earn something less than a 90, you can continue in the course, but you're gonna get a zero for the quiz. So an 89 is a zero for this. So for the orientation quiz, you're either gonna get a, 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 a 1%, all, all credit for it, or you're going to get zero. I mean, it's just one percentage point, so in some sense, it's not a big deal, but you're gonna wanna get the higher grade. For one thing, these are the easiest points you'll ever earn in this class. And number two, this is information that you will need that will help you invest your time in the class most appropriately. You can see that we have discussion uh, a board here we have that's worth five percent of your grade in some sense these are the easiest points in some sense these are the hardest points they're easiest in that there is no reason in the world why you can't get all five of these points even if you aren't the best student even if some of the concepts here throw you for a loop maybe you have a learning difference or something like that and you don't take tests well guess what every single person who is been able to uh, graduate from high school or get a GED can get all 5% of these. This just takes the effort. So that's what makes it easy because you can do it. Um, for the most part, I'm not going to be evaluating, do I agree 100% with your answer? What I'm looking at is, are you discussing the issues? Did you uh, meet the requirements of, of the discussion board? If you make a genuine effort to participate in it, you've got all the points you need. You've accomplished the goal. So that's what makes it easy. What makes it hard for some folks is that there are a few hoops you have to jump through. And let's just go through what those hoops are. For one thing, you have to make a post. And your first post has to be at least 100 words long. I mean, that's five sentences. This is not hard. This is not a heavy burden for you to assume. The next thing is that you have to list the word count for that post. You can have a 400 page post, and I've seen this happen sometimes, and forget the word count, and guess what? Even though I can see it's well over 100 words, I'm going to take a deduction. No word count means a deduction just the nature of the beast. If you have under 100 words and you misrepresent your word count, that's an um, academic honesty issue. And so we'll need to be discussing that. So be sure your word count is correct. Um, you can put it in Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word will give you the word count. Google Docs, I think, will also give you a word count. So you don't have to count it manually. Just be sure to get the count. Um, and also be sure that it's over 100 words. If it's under 100 words and you represent that it's under 100 words, you're going to lose a point, but you're not, you, you haven't misled me. So it's not an academic honesty issue. In addition to your substantive post, you have to make one reply post. You can make more. Lots of students really, really like the discussion boards. I think they are kind of interesting, and so hopefully you'll enjoy them as well. But you have to make at least one reply post, and that reply post just has to be 40 words long. Now, it can't just be, hey, I loved your post. Thanks for doing it. 
um, you have to respond substantively to the issue. There needs to be some discussion going on here. Um, and so be sure to, to watch for that at, when you make your reply post. So again, super easy points to get. You just have to be sure that your first post is for 100 words, that you list the word count in your first, first post, and that you have a reply post of at least 40 words. And it is responsive to the subject that the topic is about. Okay, now let's go to chapter assignments. Um, you will see as we go back to this activity that there are chapter assignments and chapter quizzes. Um, actually, they're kind of the same thing in this course because every all of these all of these documents here pull from the same a test bank. Um, so uh, I have actually for each one of the chapters I have two or three test banks depending upon how I've set that up. And so um, when you get your chapter assignment questions, randomly selected questions will be part of your assignment. Your assignment will probably be different than every other person's in the class. I mean, there's not an infinite number of questions, so yes, there probably will be some repeated questions, but they won't have all of the same questions. Um, your chapter quiz will pull from those same uh, uh, question banks. So you may actually see some of the questions on your chapter assignment also appear on your chapter quiz. It's even possible that some of those questions will appear on your midterm or your final examination. And so you will see some old friends, so to speak, um, on these documents. You may say, well, gosh, if they're the same questions, why do you give us a chapter assignment and a chapter quiz? Well, um, the questions are the same categories, but I treat them differently. So let's go through what the differences are. Chapter assignments are open book and open notes. So you can use all of those resources that you might have. The only thing you can't use is your neighbor. Um, you can't uh, work with other students on these tasks. You are, however, welcome to come to my office hours and we'll sit down together and we will find the answers. And so if you come to my office hours, you know, we, we, we'll figure out what the correct answers are and we'll get you to that finish line. I'm not going to sit down and say, okay, the answer to, to one is A, the answer to two is 17 or whatever. We'll find the answers and we'll talk through why they're the correct answer but we will get it done if you need it, need to have that happen. This is also untimed. So this is an opportunity to kind of dive into the material to confirm your level of um, experience. Another thing is that you can take this assignment more than once. Let's say you do it the first time and you miss a few questions. So you can go ahead and do it again. Your highest grade is the one that's gonna count. Obviously the questions will be different the next time, so uh, you'll, you'll see some differences in that area, but it allows you to dive more and more into the content. Chapter quizzes, again, are gonna pull from the same uh, question banks, <coughs> but they're gonna be different. Um, they are um, going to be closed notes and closed book, and of course you cannot get assistance from anybody I'm not going to help you with them, of course. And you only have 10 minutes. There will be typically 15 questions on these. Um, and so you have about, you know, a half, a one half to one minute per question. Uh, I restrict the time for uh, test integrity purposes. I'm not going to be there looking over your shoulder, and there will be some students who do choose to, uh, you know, cheat basically by looking at their book or their notes to find some answers. But because the time is restricted to only 10 minutes, they're not going to be able to find all of the answers. And so there is some inherent um, limitation to the level of cheating. Now, some students. Um, are very concerned about having a, a quiz that is time restricted. They may have a concern about their the quality of their Wi-Fi connection or something like that. They may just feel a lot of test stress as a result. Maybe they have a learning difference or something along those lines. And so having a restriction on their test time causes them a fair amount of anxiety and may negatively impact their performance on the quizzes. That's the last thing I want. I want you to be so successful on the assignments and the quizzes and the test and I don't certainly don't want the method that I'm presenting the quizzes to impact you in any negative way. So what I do is I give you the option of taking these same quizzes at the testing center. In that situation obviously it'll still be closed notes and closed books and you won't be able to ask any questions of anyone but you can take all day on it. I mean you won't want to there's only a few questions on it again there's typically 15 
Um, but it, you can easily take more than uh, the 10 minutes and 30 minutes, whatever you would like. Um, if you choose to do that, you have to choose one way or the other. So in other words, you're either doing doing them on the online or you're doing them face to face. And so let me know, uh, or you, what, what you'll need to do is reach out to me. We'll sit down and we'll talk about how we're gonna go forward so that there's no chance that you accidentally take a, a chapter quiz online and then attempt to take one in the testing center. So you do need to stop by. If you aren't in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, then we can do it by telephone, but I really do like to sit down and talk just for maybe five, 10 minutes to go over how that's going to proceed and once you opt for that then you'll need to do that going forward so I want to flag that for you as an option for students who uh, would prefer now I will tell you the students who've elected to do that have not seen that their grades have improved um, so it again I mean, you may be the person that the, the uh, uh, it doesn't follow the rule, but uh, generally speaking, students oftentimes will come to me halfway through the semester and say, my quiz grades aren't that great. I think I would do better in the testing center. And I say, that's great. Let's set that up for you. And I, I have yet to have a student whose grades on those quizzes suddenly started getting better. But again, uh, you may be the, the exception to that rule. You'll see here that on the chapter assignments and the chapter quizzes that I only take the 10 highest grades. Um, now. Let me provide a little bit of clarity about this. Uh, we actually have, I think, about 16 chapters. Uh, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 chapters. Um, so you can take 16 quizzes. If you take all 16 quizzes, I will take the 10 highest grades. So why do I do that? Well, I do that because I know technology fails sometimes. Um, the canvas blinkers out on you or your apartment Wi-Fi dies on you or your, your laptop isn't a, uh, working well or uh, something else happens. And um, even though you knew this stuff cold, you get a zero on it just because of technical issues. I understand that that's going to happen sometimes. Um, maybe not to you, but to somebody in the class. And that's very, very frustrating. And people are like, well, gosh, I don't get a zero on it. Well, guess what? You won't get a zero on that because that will be one of the grades that we drop. I'm not, however, going to turn it back on for you. Um, if you find that, gosh, my Wi-Fi at my apartment or my home is unreliable, then you can take these quizzes in one of the computer labs that Colin offers. We have them on all the big campuses, and because you're a student here, you are entitled to use them. And under those circumstances, you shouldn't have those types of issues, and if you do, then you'll have somebody in the computer lab that can vouch for you. Um, so for that reason, that's kind of our insurance policy. Even if you have technical difficulties, it's not a problem because that will be one of the grades that we drop. You're welcome to let me know that that happened, but again, it's not gonna be something that requires a solution other than the automatic policies. So if you would pause here and go ahead and write down that you only need to take 10 of the chapter assignments and 10 of the chapter quizzes. And that's also true for, um, I think it's also true for the discussion participation. Let me make sure that's right, though. Um, cheat sheet here. Yes, 10. So that's also for the discussion board. 10 is kind of a magic number in this course. 10 discussion boards, 10 um, um, ass a chapter assignments and 10 chapter quizzes. If you do those, you're good. You can do more than 10 because after all, if you don't get 100, you don't, don't get a perfect on an assignment, um, then you may choose to do an 11th where you will get a better grade and will be able to drop that one grade that's lower. But of course, if you are getting, you know, perfects on your first 10, you may not want to do any more. And that's your call. Now on the assignments, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because you can take you say that the chapter six assignment, you can take it 10 times. There's no caps on the number of times you take it. And let's say all, well, let's say you take it 10 times and all 10 of the times you take the chapter six assignment, you get a perfect grade. 
well, that can't be your 10 highest grades because that's for each chapter. Once you, let's say the first time you take the chapter six uh, chapter assignment, you get a 90. And the next time you get 100, well, your 90 falls away. It's not available for us to look at at this point. So you'll only ever have one grade for each one of your chapter assignments. So you need to do it for 10 separate chapters. That's not an issue with the chapter quizzes because you can only take those once. But I wanted to flag that for you so you, you got a sense as to how that was going to work. You can see, though, even if you have really great grades on your chapter assignments for 10 chapters, you may be tempted to say, well, I just won't do the next six chapters. But it's still useful for you to do because those six chapters will be on the midterm and the final examination, and your familiarity with those questions will help you do better on those tests. So uh, don't feel like you're restricted that you can only take 10 of the uh, chapter assignments. I think it's a good idea to do even more. So hopefully that makes sense to you. If you have questions about that, of course, feel free to reach out to me and we can talk through those issues. We also have a midterm and a final examination and they're pretty highly weighted. The midterm is 25% and the final examination is 29%. In this course, we take the midterm on the late side. About two-thirds of the course is over uh, when we do the midterm, um, and so you'll, you'll uh, find it uh, occurring a little bit late. I do that for a couple of reasons. One is that I know that in the midpoint of the semester, most students have so many tests, and it can be difficult to prepare for all those tests, and so I push mine a little bit later, so hopefully you've had a bit of a breather, and you'll have a little bit more time to prepare. At least that's my hope for you. I hope that works out. Um, the final, of course, I don't have any flexibility in that. It just is when it is. Um, but um, you are required to take both the midterm and the final examination. Um, there is no way to uh, get out of the final examination since it's uh, worth 29% of your grade. You definitely don't want to avoid taking that. I've had uh, one student in the past who was a very high A student and um, she did not come to the final examination, or she did not come to take the final examination. And so I reached out to her. Um, well, while the window was still open, I was very surprised by the fact that she hadn't taken it. And she shared with me, oh, well, I don't need to take it. I've already got an A in the course. And I share with her, well, actually, it's worth 29% of your grade. So if you have 100 in the course, otherwise, you are only really having a 71 at this point if you don't take the final examination uh, because there is no way a high grade doesn't get you out of that and I know some instructors do that so I always like to flag that be sure to come for the midterms and the finals otherwise your grade is not going to be a happy thing okay so let's talk about um, uh, how this the finals and the midterms are set up in this course um, they're set the same way. Um, you, have, you will have two options about how you take the finals and the midterms. You will not have the option of taking the finals and the midterms in um, your home in an unproctored environment like you do with chapter quizzes. I permit it for chapter quizzes because after all they're not a huge part of your grade. Each one of them is worth only 2% of your grade because you're taking 10 quizzes and they're worth 20%, so it's only 2% each. But the midterm and the final examination each are worth 25 and 29%. I'm not born yesterday. I know that there will be students who uh, don't have a very high sense of self-worth and who think uh, my integrity isn't worth as much as getting a good grade on this, this test. And so um, I want to protect the students who who do value themselves highly and do recognize that their personal integrity has real value. Um, and so I want to create an environment in which um, everyone is playing on the same playing field and everyone is going to be uh, put in a position where they are going to be able to act ethically in terms of the com completion of their tests. So your final and midterm will have to be proctored. There are two ways to proctor it. The vast majority of you will choose to take it in one of the Collin testing centers. We have three. They're free. Your tuition dollars have already paid for it. When you go to take it, you will need your student ID. They will not accept a driver's license or some other identification. So you'll be, you want to be sure to have that. You'll just come in and take the test and that's all there is to it. Um, you can take it on any of the three campuses, but I actually drop it off on the Frisco campus. That's where my office is. 
every now and again there's some snafu and the test is not forwarded or at least the test testing center doesn't receive the forwarded test um, at say the the uh, uh, McKinney campus or the uh, Plano campus um, I always request that it be forwarded to those campuses but I don't actually go to those campuses and make sure. All I do is check the box on the form and I count on uh, the professionals in those offices to take care of it. And most of the time it works just fine. But every now and again, somebody misfiles it or doesn't send it or doesn't receive it or there's a, a problem with the fax machine or whatever the issue is and it doesn't get to the other testing center. It is your responsibility then to, if you're going to take it at another testing center, to contact that testing center and make sure they have it. And if they don't have it, to say, hey, my instructor made it available. Contact the Frisco Testing Center and get that document because it is available for them. So you need to kind of be the proactive person in that situation. You need to take that role because I may not be available. I may be out of town or, or otherwise unavailable. Uh, plus you're the one who wants to take it in a place other than the Frisco Testing Center and so you'll need to take the lead on that. If you wait until the last day and it's only a couple of hours before the testing center closes, you may not be able to do it at that testing center that you prefer. So. One thing is don't wait to the last day, of course, and number one and number two, call ahead. Make sure that all the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed. Um, you can, you're welcome to take it to the other testing center, but you also need to have some agency in that, that respect. So that's one way you can take the test. But let's say you are um, sitting on a beach in Hawaii or you're um, uh, climbing um, Mount Everest. I guess you probably couldn't do it there. They probably don't have good Wi-Fi on Mount Everest. But let's say you're in some fun place when it comes time to take the midterm or the final examination. You can't possibly come back to Colin. We wouldn't want you to if you're having so much fun. But you can still complete the class and that is by using the Proctor U to, to Proctor U tool. This is a way that you will be remotely proctored. Now there are a few things I want to flag about this for you. Um, it is available to you for sure, but there's some things that you want to keep in mind. First of all, your computer setup has to be uh, 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 it has to work with the system. It has to have the components necessary, compatible, I guess is what I'm looking for. It has to be compatible, and so you'll have to run some tests. If your computer is reasonably recent and it has a webcam, most likely it will be compatible, um, but you do need to confirm that. The other thing is, is it's not free. Um, it is on a time basis. It, the, the cost can be anywhere from $9 to about $30. You will be responsible for paying for that. So if you're thinking, well, it would save me money because I won't have to drive in or I won't have to get a babysitter, probably it isn't going to save you money because you, if you are using the Proctor U service, you'll still need the babysitter unless your kids are, you know, maybe a teenager or something um, so it's not a money-saving activity but especially if you're in a remote location maybe you're uh, gonna be in Houston or something like that then it can make sense um, just be aware that there is a date that you have to communicate this to me it needs to be 10 days before the start of the window for taking the examination so go ahead and, and make a record of this right now, turn me off, and write down that you'll need to contact me 10 days before the window opens. So let me show you how you know when the window opens. You'll see here that the window opens on this date. In fact, this instruction right here gives you the date. You see the date's in green, this date. Okay, sorry, the date is not in green. Let me put the date back into green. And then you'll have this date, which is also not in green. Let me put it in green for you. This is the date. So 10 days before this date. So, you know, the 14th, for example. But you know what? You don't have to wait. If you know right now you want to use ProctorU, or at least you are seriously considering using ProctorU, pause me right now and send me an email. You know my email address, cgroover.colin.edu.
this address right here. So pause me and send me an email if that's what you want to use. Be sure to include in your subject line the course. This is BUSI 2301 and include in your subject line request for ProctorU. Also include your name in the subject line and then send me an email about that. Okay. Now we'll get back to the subject. Now that you turn me back on, we're ready to continue with the material. Um, this is th this um, date is for both the midterm and the final, and you'll need to request it twice for that purpose. Um, so many times I'll have a student who just does it for one or the other. Now you may be thinking, why do you require this? Well, there's a fair amount of effort both you and I need to take to set up the proctor you. It's not an automatic thing. I don't want to blow it out of proportion, but it's going to take you 30 minutes. It's going to take me a couple of hours to set it up. And so it's a, and it's actually a several part process uh, to get it set up. And we also are going to require proctor you to do some things. And that usually takes a few days for proctor you to get everything set up. So by, by giving ourselves these 10 days, we make sure that we're successful in doing so. Um, so be sure to, to calendar that so that you can go ahead and complete the, the course. And of course, if you forget, it's no worries. You can still take it at one of our testing centers. Okay, I said before that I'm really pretty compulsive about email, and that is true, but my family spends most of our weekends at a lake house. We do not have cell phone reception, and we do not have internet. It's very intentional on our part. It's family time. And so uh, Friday evenings, Saturdays, and Sundays, you cannot get me. It's just not even possible. My own mom can't reach me under those circumstances. And so um, during the week, I am I'm, I'm very available, but during this time, I'm not probably going to be available. Um, so let's say you're trying to take the test on Saturday. And uh, for some reason, the testing center doesn't have it. Uh, you can send me emails. You can try to call me, but you're not going to get me. So keep that in mind that I'm not going to be available. It's not every single weekend, but it's probably uh, more weekends than not. I am a stickler for emails. Uh, let, me exp let me defend to you, first of all, why I am, and then I'll talk about what the uh, parameters are. I know most of the people in this class are not going to go to law school. You're not going to become a paralegal. This is helpful information for you to have. You will use it, but it's not the focus of your academic life. And I am perfectly fine with that. We don't need thousands more attorneys or paralegals, so that's okay. Um, what I try to do, in addition to teaching about law, is hopefully give you some life skills that really are going to be things that improve the quality of your professional life, that help you get that job and keep that job and get that promotion. And let me tell you, a major problem that I see with students is that nobody has taught them how to write an email. Um, writing an email is not a hard thing, but it does require somebody actually saying, this is how you do it. And this is my little cheat sheet about how to do it. I'm not going to go through this, but I'm happy to sit down with you and assist you in this area. I expect you to do these things. So cut and paste this out of your resume and, and print it up and put it in your folder. So whenever you send me an email, you go through these things because guess what? I will go back to you and say, ah, thanks for your email. Uh, your subject line isn't what we need, so go ahead and resend it to me with a subject line that's going to work. Or, oh, guess what? You've made this mistake. You're going to be really super annoyed when I do that, but by the end of the semester, hopefully you will be on automatic pilot when it comes to emails. You will send professional, clear, appropriate emails, and that is a life skill that will pay dividend upon dividend upon dividend. So consider me that cranky English teacher you had that taught you how to write whatever and you hated, hated, hated every minute of it, but now you look back and say, gosh, I still hate her, but <laughs> she did teach me what I needed to know. So um, before you send me an email, go through these um, items to make sure you have it. And follow these even if you're a pretty good writer because there's probably some things that you haven't been told or ha aren't aware of that you need to do in order to be successful in writing a professional email. Another thing I like to share with you is that emails are awesome. I love email. I really, really love email. But emails are not the perfect solution to every problem. Um, Email, I, I call them, I call emails tone deaf. 
uh, documents. Um, we've all probably been in a situation where we sent a message, maybe we're in a hurry, and so we don't say the please and the thank you and all that kind of stuff. The person gets our email, and they're like, gosh, that person's mad at me. Well, no, the, the sender wasn't mad at all. They were just in a hurry. They didn't dress it up with all the niceties. But it sounds angry or it sounds presumptuous or it's or what you thought was a joke comes across as an insult all of those things can happen in emails um, so you have to be really careful about emails that you are communicating the tone that you want it's really hard to do that because you can't hear the voice of the person speaking so something that you could have a two-minute conversation over is probably going to take you 15 minutes to write the email and it's going to take the other person 15 or 20 minutes to respond to the email and so you really didn't save time it took you more time I mean I suppose in some sense it saved time and that it may have been hard for you and that person to connect at the same time to have that telephone conversation but it is in some sense a clunky tool a quick email just doesn't work it doesn't communicate effectively. Usually what happens when I get a quickly worded email is the first thing I do is I say, okay, wait a second, let's start again. Here are the, the ways you write an email, send it to me again and we'll work with it from that standpoint. But even if I did take your email and the version that you send it, I've got 15 questions to ask because I'm not quite sure what you're saying. And so now you have to go back and do those steps anyway. So that hastily worded email actually is delaying you getting the answer that you want and it's causing you to work harder than if you had just stopped and said you know what the next 10 minutes I'm just going to think about how to word this email so I give the recipient all the information he or she needs and give the recipient um, a context for why I'm asking this and, and enlisting that person's assistance so that in person wants that person wants to help me all of those things that you ought to be doing when you're writing the email do it consciously on the first draft but even when you do that even when you're completely successful many times the answer will be thanks so much for your email let's schedule the time to talk because what you're asking me is something or what you're asking a recipient may not be me is something that isn't it isn't going to lend itself to the email format for example I might get a question such as um, what's the test going to be like well are you asking me how many questions there are going to be are you asking me how many questions on chapter four are there going to be are you asking me how many true false are there going to be are you asking me um, you know uh, examples of questions that might be you in know, the style of the questions that might be on the test um, there, there's a 50 different ways I could go with that and I could write you an answer that's you know 10 pages long um, and I still might not even get to the questions that you have on the other hand, if you if we talk on the phone and you say, well, really what I'm interested in is, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping to do it between this activity and that activity, but I'm only going to have about 70 minutes. And so I want to make sure that I can actually do it in that time. So what do you think? That's a great question. And probably that's something I could answer via email for you. But um, when we talk about it, we can sort through and then maybe you have a follow-up question. Well, you know, you say I can do it in 70 minutes, but I'm a really slow test taker. Um, it probably takes me, you know, twice as long as the average person. Oh, okay, well then probably you can't do it in 70 minutes. There's a back and forth. I need information from you, you need information from me, we're sharing, and that is a conversation email isn't a conversation and so it's not always the best way of, of uh, solving those issues okay and then here is our course calendar you'll see I have a topic for every week um, sometimes there will be just one chapter sometimes there will be more than one chapter so you can see in our second week we've got two chapters I do that for this one because um, especially the chapter two is, is short and we don't do a lot of substance on it um, you'll see um, that uh, we also have typically this week we have um, two chapters if you're taking the course of the summer you'll see that most weeks we have two chapters just because there's fewer weeks over the summer um, this is a, a good guideline to follow 
um, you don't have to follow it necessarily. You certainly can work ahead, but you need to be aware of these dates, especially, of course, the midterm date and the final examination date. Also, the discussion boards are important for that purpose. Let's go to the calendar here real quick. And we can see that below every, ass every assignment, so I'm, I'm in module one now, every assignment you will see the due date. So for example, for the discussion uh, board, for this one, it is due on January 27th. So this week we have two discussion boards, they're both due January 27th. You'll see that both the assignments and the quizzes have a due date at the very end of the semester. Now, I highly recommend that you not wait until the very end of the semester. For one thing, this chapter is on the midterm, and so you'll want to use these uh, uh, tests and quizzes to prepare yourself for the midterm, and so you'll want to take it at least before then. You'll want to pace yourself. But um, you're an adult. You are in a position to decide how to best budget your time. So technically the only things you have to do during the week that the chapter is assigned are the discussion boards but i like i recommend that you stay current and in fact i encourage you actually to work ahead especially if you have things coming up midterms or other tests that might interfere with your ability to perform on a particular week so i'm going to end the lecture right now and we will go back um, in lecture in our uh, second orientation lecture to go through uh, the canvas course and to do a powerpoint but i wanted to introduce you to the syllabus to begin with and um, get you started on that um, i look forward to talking with you or hearing uh, or uh, for sharing with you the orientation materials um, in this first presentation. I look forward to you participating in the next one. Thanks for your attention and have a wonderful day.